Start recording. Stop recording. Y'all ready for this? Woo! Boom! And let me pull us up here, see if we're live. Welcome everybody to our Sunday live stream. We do this every single Sunday at 8, 40, 5 Pacific Standard Time in the morning. And it, the thumbnail. <laughs> we got to work on that. That's Common that's, mistakes homebrewers make. Uh, that is pretty bad. There's one watching. I'm the only one watching so far. Nice. Ah, uh, there's more. All right, there we go. Then we got another person too. Woo! <laughs> Welcome everybody to <laughs> our Sunday live stream every Sunday at 8.45 Pacific Standard Time in the morning. A uh, kind of general breakdown on this. We go over a little bit of genus and or general beer news. We talk about a BJCP style of the week where we break down a style of beer and tell you things that we think about it. And then we go into two discussion topics of which today we have common mistakes new and old homebrewers make and partial mashing. Why I do it and what is it? Perfect. Uh, yeah, so we got some fun stuff. Probably, you probably jumped again a little bit on that, by the way. Should have let a few pe more people tune in. but uh, I'm just doing it for the recording. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what's going on by now. God, what number of live stream are we on now? I feel like we're... Uh, 35,800? 35. Wow. That yeah. Is, that is a lot. I don't know that we're quite there, but uh, I do feel like we <clears throat> are coming up uh, probably on like 30 or something like that by now. I don't know. Someone count it for us. Uh, let us know. When did we start doing these? Uh, we started doing them... Like regularly. Last January? No, it hasn't been that long. It's got to be January. Like, cause, yeah, because the, uh, um, the How I Started a Brewery for $2,000 was in February. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, or, yeah, golly, so. we might be coming up on 50 live streams. Who knows? Uh, lots of live streams out there. Thank you, everyone, that uh, has been watching these for so long with us. Appreciate and, uh, the support and everything. We're going to kind of hold off just a minute and let, let some few more people tune in. I see uh, the people watching is jumping up. Welcome and good morning. Uh, on this lovely fall <laughs> slash winter morning. Brisk, snowy day that uh, we have here in Spokane, Washington. Yeah, it's like uh, mid-teens here this morning. So it is, it is cold by, by any October standard. Yes. Um, this, is, this would not be anything out of the realm if it was like December. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's still October. Uh, speaking of which, um, to kind of, I guess, start into our genus news, uh, yeah, we had, what day is it today? It is Sunday. Um, that was Friday night we had that snow come through. Yeah, so yeah, it snowed yeah, like it started, yeah. five, six inches even, depending on where you're at, um, on uh, Friday night. So that kind of hit us out of nowhere. It went from like beautiful 65 degree weather to snowstorm and now it's 15 degrees this morning so. we'll have some we'll have some late summer early fall again next week though so you know it's that's just yeah how it goes when we're when transitioning seasons in the northwest here pretty much um yeah so real fun i got you yeah hendrix in in uh south africa it's like dang it i want to i want to be there right now without any snow actually maybe there is snow i'm sure know. there is up in the mountains it says troubled south africa so maybe there's there's uh -oh. something there that you don't don't want to be there for oh well, maybe i don't want to be there Shmeow. Oh, really? And you're, yes. Uh, got some Stevie Nicks playing there. Yeah, you know, it's just what I do. I was trying to Google some stuff. <laughs> oh. <real quick. laughs> uh, I'm going to butcher your name. Uh, Atheon, I think, says there's already 10 inches of snow in Minnesota. <laughs> nice. Make a snow angel. Take, send us a picture on Instagram. Yeah, I don't envy Minnesota or any of those kind of like interior Midwest states. Yeah, the ones that get like, yeah, crazy, crazy winters, negative 40 degree temperature lows. Yeah. Yeah, we like hardly ever get below zero here, which... Um, zero Fahrenheit, not Celsius, obviously. Below. Yeah, no, we get below zero Celsius quite a bit. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> um, sometimes we'll go below zero Kelvin, but that's just on a rare occasion. I know, on that really rare occasion. <laughs> yeah. Every, and nobody even realizes it happened, right? I know. It just <laughs> it's, pops it's right crazy. back out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so other genus news. We did do a uh, collaboration with Natural 20 Brewing Company, and that was a peanut butter puffed cereal. Uh, porter. So uh, we use the Reese's Puff cereal. Uh, our friend's name that was the owner slash brewer at Nat 20. His name is Reese. And so we, Reese's, you got, you got to do it, you know? So we've got, got a peanut butter it. porter on tap. It is imperial. It's delicious. It's kind of along the same vein as our Count Chocula boosted with a little bit of vanilla. Uh, and of course, all those chocolate notes that you want. But uh, yeah. yeah, so that's on tap now. So we are loaded up with some uh, essentially candy beers for Halloween coming up this week. So. Yeah, we're ready. Uh, yeah, which is actually <clears throat> on a Friday. Friday? Saturday. Saturday? Yeah. Halloween's on a Saturday. Awesome. Halloween's yeah. on a Saturday. We're going to start a, like, make a little party event. 
Yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, come come try our candy beers this week. Um, grab a few cans to go for uh, your little uh, kind of social distancing Halloween. Yeah, uh, beers to go. Uh, it's 86 and fix. 86 is a high in fix. heck was that sound? I don't know. Did you just drop something? Nope, that was not me. There's a ghost in here. Uh, 86, Ooh. I want to be wherever that is. 86 sounds fantastic. By uh, the way, do we... Oh, no, we should have... I was going to say, should we wear costumes next Sunday? But that's like the day after Halloween, so it'd be yeah, a little awkward. I actually will be out of town, too. So. Oh, that's right. So I'll wear um, a I'll just I wear may, my... Uh, I may try to call in. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just wear my uh, uh, morning after. What's that? My walk of shame outfit. <laughs> Every day for Peter. Fuck <laughs> that's, that. Yeah, that's most days. Um, <clears throat> all right. Anyway, yeah. Also, um, we got uh, the last few things to round out our kitchen because uh, people have really been enjoying our food. Um, honestly, I've heard nothing but great feedback about our charcuterie boards, too. Yeah. Apparently, we're uh, kicking everybody else's butt on those. Um, so, yeah, we got a fridge and a freezer coming in to, so we can store more stuff and hopefully make a little bit of money. Yeah, start right getting now, our costs down. Yeah, our yeah, costs are like, really I think right, right, right we now, now we're basically to, selling at cost. Yeah. Uh, it's, lo- it's you know, not a lot below. It's not food margins, you know, but mm-hmm. uh, we're basically trying to get food out so that we can have that option and be right. have that license. But uh, we'll start getting it all costed out in the next couple of weeks and get things rolling a little bit better. For sure. And uh, yeah, lastly, um, America shirts. presidential debate shirts. Uh, yeah, Quike for president, right? That's that's what we're settling on. Yeah, Quike for president. Yep. <laughs> Quike for president. So if you have uh, a political opinion and you want one of the two candidates to win, comment that uh, something completely different in the comments. Actually, I actually don't want to start a fight. <laughs> so. And buy a, buy, buy a I like Quike t-shirt. I too. like Quike. Actually, I saw that, um, some of you actually were buying those too, so. We really appreciate that, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for supporting us by doing that as well. And we're almost up to 80 people watching. As always, if we get 100 likes, you'll get a spoken word poem about something from me, um, just because that's what Frazzled Penguin decided a couple weeks ago, and we kind of just stuck with it. <laughs> uh, if we get up to 200 likes, uh, Logan will beer bong an entire pot of hot coffee. So, Oh, you know. no, don't, no, don't do 200 likes. Yeah, so you know, I'm just uh, throwing things out there. <laughs> um, but that's pretty much it for our genus news, which means it's time for our beer, beer of the week. week. Boop, 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 beer, beer of the week. week. Boop, woo. Which today we're going something a little bit askew, uh, which is an Italian grape ale. Yeah, so uh, this style was actually thrown out by a <clears throat> viewer, golly, I think like three, four weeks ago now. Um, and actually, we've kind of been pushing this whole uh, live stream back a few weeks just because other ones have popped up um, that seemed more timely um and uh but yeah italian grape ale found actually in bjcp guidelines in appendix b and i kid you not this is the very last page of like it's like page what 79 i think it's x3 i have it this is style x3 yeah the style is x3 so bjcp appendix b uh italian styles x3 (laughs) and that is italian grape ale so Overall impressions of uh, this beer um, are actually pretty wide, too. So everything from um, being a nice, light, refreshing beer um, to being a a much more complex style when it comes down to it. Yeah, and I feel like this is going to go along the vein of, you know, kind of what we were talking about last week with the, you know, historical meads versus new meads, uh, where they they started out as mostly honey and what's to beer, and this is kind of the exact, and then turned into the exact opposite with the brewing industry. Um, that's kind of where we're going to start to lean into with your your variations that you can play with, whether or not it's more wine-like or more non-wine-like. Yep. So, um, yeah, and we actually have, um, we have a, what's called a rosé IPA on tap right now, and I feel like this actually yeah. sort of kind of borderlines um, – uh, in in this category, to be quite honest, and we um, actually made that rose IPA before we even knew that the Italian that grape ale was yeah. a style. So. Yeah, so I, I definitely think like it, it it could fall into that category for sure. Um, as for general stats on it, we're looking at 10 to 30 IBUs, um, so really not a very bitter beer. Um, also, um, we've got uh, what, what is it? Uh, oh, I didn't write the starting gravities. Let me look that up real fast. Uh, starting, starting gravity could be 1043 to 1090. That's yeah, a so huge range. Exactly, Jenks, five. Yeah. You owe me 10 sodas. <laughs> and then final gravity is anywhere from 1007 to 1015. Um, and I think the biggest thing to note here is that 1007, um, the fact that these beers can finish pretty darn dry. Um, and really what this comes down to, um, which is the sort of main thing to address and what's in the name of this style, is the fact that you will be using grape must uh, as uh, part of your sugar sources in this beer. Yeah, so the same kind of concept as if you're doing a braggot style beer, uh, but instead of using honey, you are using grape must. Uh, the easiest way to do that and the way that we actually did it with our rosé IPA was to actually use kitted uh, wine um, 
uh, concentrated wine must. Um, we got we have like wine kits that we have in the shop that we obviously want to cycle through um, before they expire, which is kind of the impetus for us doing our rosé IPA. Um, but it's probably a lot easier, honestly, to use like a white wine grape than it is a red wine grape. Yeah. Um, and the whole point of adding this is it actually adds a whole nother layer of complex complexity. Um, complexity. Complexity. Uh, yeah, you're going to get a lot of flavor off of the wine must. Uh, that flavor is going to be imparted into the beer, um, which is otherwise going to be um, a fairly simple grain bill, uh, typically. And, uh, and yeah, any of the hops you're going to use are really going to be designed to accentuate uh, the, the grape must itself and not necessarily overpower it. You know, the one we did, we called it a rosé IPA, but at the same time, our, our hop bill is actually pretty restrained on it. Um, you definitely don't want to turn that into, you know, a big West Coast hop bill. Right. Um, Ours is very much more on the hazy kind of train where everything is going yeah. in Whirlpool or late edition. So it's a softer, fruitier uh, hop composition designed to complement those natural fruity notes that you'll get off of the uh, wine grapes. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and again, you know, these, this style is obviously has a huge range. Um, but uh, also part of, you know, adding that grape must, it's, it's going to dry out the style to a certain extent. So on the low alcohol versions, you know, your 5% versions, um, it's going to be really dry, really crisp, really crushable. Right. You see what I did there? Because it's wine crushing season with uh, grapes and they go, <laughs> they go through a crush to get grape must. Uh, yeah. Whereas the um, higher alcohol versions that are pushing those double digit marks, um, are actually going to be, uh, most of those uh, are going to be barrel age variations. So um, they're going to have more body, a lot of complexity because, you know, you're getting flavors from the grain base, you're getting flavors from the hop additions, you're getting flavors from the, the great must, and then from a barrel itself. So Yeah, and sometimes um, they can even be a little bit barnyardy uh, when they get into that range. Uh, yeah. It's important to note when you do things in that high end of the style, though, you never want that oak or any barnyardiness to be dominant. It should just be a nice complement to the wine, like yeah. with most wines. It's not uh, the barrel that gives you the most flavor. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so it's talking about the great must, um, up to 40% is what it says. Um, I think typically you're going to see um, somewhere in that 20 to 30% range of your total sugars. I feel like we, yeah, we were probably, yeah, we're actually probably only about 20%, I think, of our total sugars. Yeah, it was in a, a, in a, in a 31 gallon batch. Was it? No, it was a two barrel. So, uh, oh, was it? Oh, so it might have even been a little less. Yeah, it might have been, been a little 10% less. then. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we only did about 10%. Um, and even with that, it was, it did make a noticeable impact on the beer. So yeah. Um, and both color and so we did a red wine, uh, for ours and it was a Cabernet and Berlin blend and it actually added a significant amount of color, which looks beautiful right now. A lot of yeah. people are loving that beer. Oh, speaking of which that is going to be our malt of the week is actually not a malt at all. And that is the great mess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we used a red wine, um, must, it was, you said Caber Cabernet? Cabernet Merlot. Cabernet Merlot, uh, must. Um, but like Peter said, if you, um, I think the red wines were great on the higher alcohol range. Um, I would definitely recommend more along the white wine, um, must side of things if you want to go for a little bit more sessionable, um, beer. And Peter's just gonna, yep, yeah, just plop that there. It's not, it's not even facing the right direction. What? <laughs> the, the Merlot is on this side. Anyway. Uh, he's, uh, oh, is he? <laughs> okay. He's uh, giving you a, a quick example of what these kits might look like. And obviously that's a five gallon kit. Um, so uh, that's what I would probably say to do is if you do actually enjoy a decent wine um, to purchase one of those kits and then pull about a gallon off of it and throw it in a five gallon batch of beer and then just do a four gallon batch of wine. Super so, easy way to go. Yeah. So that would be a kind of a really fun way to kind of knock out two birds with one stone there. And uh, yeah, so um, wine must, uh, that's going to be our malt of the week up to 40%. Um, as low as 10%, you still get a fantastic flavor and impact from it. Um, as for our hops of the week, though, um, something a little bit softer, something a little bit freer, right? Belma. Belma is actually one of my favorite hops to use as blends and session IPAs because it has a... Uh, a nice dominant fruit note without being aggressive at all. It actually pairs well with more aggressive hops like Citra. Um, and it's kind of known for having a subtle strawberry character. Yeah, so um, Belma is actually a daughter of Magnum and uh, I'm going to butcher this. Kita Midori. Yes, you nailed it actually. Um, and uh, yeah, so fairly high alpha hops, um, 8 to 10-ish, 11%. I don't think I've ever seen it 11, but... 
Um, but yeah, fairly. I've seen some pretty high alpha Belmos, yeah. Yeah, so fairly high alpha, um, but uh, you know, low cohemulone content still, and uh, and a really nice soft hop. I think we're actually out of it right now. Yeah, now, we haven't gotten. Belma it's like now that we mentioned it, everybody's gonna be like, ah, yeah, give me some Belma. Then. I want some Belma. By the way, don't come to the shop and try to buy Belma right now. We don't have any. <laughs> we don't have any Belma. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, so it is a great hop though. Um, really, I've used it in the past when I'm trying to get like that like specific like that strawberry type character. Um, that's always my go-to hop for that. Um, but it definitely isn't um, nearly as pungent as a lot of other hops, and that's okay in this style. Yeah. Thanks uh, for the uh, super chat, Frazzle Penguin. Though, by the way, we love seeing you every Sunday morning. Hey, hey good support. morning, Frazzle Penguin. Um, yeah. As for amounts of uh, this hop, um, I would say for a five-gallon batch, um, shoot for three to four ounces, um, you know, a small bittering addition, and then maybe, you know, a couple ounces, three ounces later in the boil. I probably wouldn't even worry about a dry hop, to be honest. Um, yeah, no, you know, dry hop's going to be inappropriate, and you also might risk oxidation that you really don't need. Yep. Um, but, yeah, a nice whirlpool addition of two, three, four ounces will be plenty, and it's a soft enough hop. Soft enough hop it's going to be in that subtle pale ale range maybe, but with a lot of fruitiness that's kind of backing it up. Boop. Just my mic a little bit there. Boop. Nobody nobody's said that we're sounding bad, though. Where's our fly, pet, our, our pet fly winger today? Our pet fly. Uh, I think the flies finally got cold enough that they died. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit of snow actually helped uh, that out. That and having the garage door shut all week now. Yeah. It was yeah. cold. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, going on to our next uh, yeast of the week. And... Uh, I chose uh, a yeast from Omega, actually, and that is the OLY200, uh, which is their tropical ale strain. Omega Labs yeast. Um, yep, Omega Labs, and uh, yeah, so known for uh, producing uh, some pineapple notes um, in a sort of subtle way. Uh, we actually haven't been able to experiment with this one um, a whole lot yet, but I definitely do. Um, sounds like a really fun one that's just something a little bit different. Um, honestly seems like a nice sort of like spinoff of like the American Ale 2 strain. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, some subtle notes, but, but uh, nothing like, nothing quite as crazy, crazy as like quike strains that might honestly overwhelm this beer style. Um, because the whole thing is, is really finding that balance here. You know, we're not trying to like blow anybody away with it. Um, it's going to be more of like a really, really subtle like, ooh, and what am I picking up here? And what am I picking up there situation? So, uh, yeah, and it's going to be a good one for a lot of mid-range style or uh, mid-range strengths of this beer. It's really important that you kind of take into consideration if you're going to do a more session uh, grape ale, you might pick a slightly more flavorful yeast, maybe a saison yeast or something like that that can push forward some extra character. Um, but in that mid-range, anywhere from that like six percent all the way up to eight percent, something like this is going to be really great. And then when you get really strong, you might do something that's a really strong fermenter that can be more neutral because you're really going to try to start leaning into the natural grape sweetness and some alcohol heat and sweetness as well exactly yeah but uh, anyway yeah so oly 200 from omega labs uh, that is the uh uh it's the sac trois strain bam oh no. the, sac, the sac that used to be uh they used to think it was brett but it's not oh so it's more like citrus oh is that the same citrus yeah. i thought that was a different <clears throat> one. Oh, never mind then i thought they had a different one um, so the tropical uh, is there unless there's a tropical ale. I just seen tropical IPA. Uh, no, there is actually a tropical ale. Really? Yeah. I'm looking it up. I don't see it. I just see tropical IPA. Oh. Yeah, 200 tropical 200. IPA. Oh. Yeah. Maybe I I did that wrong then. Tropical IPA. Never mind. My bad. Um. So anyway, though, that would be a fun one to to use uh, regardless. Is, and, yeah. Uh, is also diastaticus, and so that will give you a drier beer. Yep. Um, which is going to make it better for those higher alcohol sets exactly. uh, and not so much for the lighter ones. Yeah. And, th and that's pars partially why I chose that, too. I just feel like the esters it's going to throw are going to only complement um, any of those esters that you're getting off of the wine grapes. Someone put a, uh, an idea of, I think they said single malt Pilsner uh, with Gwertzaminer and Nelson Savin. Yeah. Uh, that sounds like a really good... Uh, yeah, Nelson was honestly a close runner-up for, for the hops. Um, I can see Nelson. Um, nice even, wine character already, um, Howard obviously. Howard Blanc. Yeah, um, would be another fantastic one to use. Um, you know, any of those softer, even a lot of the New Zealand hops, I think, um, would work really well for these styles of beers. So anyway, um, and then to finish up this guy, uh, let's talk about the water um, or I should say lack thereof. So <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I spent like 20 minutes trying to find a water profile for this beer style. Yeah, it's going to be I, so very And it's I just, just like... had a blank slate. Um, yeah, ultimately, uh, nobody was posting anything about it. Um, and so I just started looking up 
water profiles in Italy. And for the most part, what I found is um, they're generally on the softer side. So yeah. my best guess is to try to go for a, a Pilsner-esque uh, water profile there. Actually, the best way to do it is to 100% mash and sparge with San Pellegrino. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, Oh God. Um, yeah. So anyway, the only for, way to do it. shoot for the softer side. I just feel like based on the description, um, you know, going for that soft side, maybe not quite like full, um, East coast IPA, you know, with those like crazy ratios of chlorides in there, but just a very soft profile in general. Yeah. Um, you know, probably balanced with chloride to sulfate ratio, but overall, you know, low bicarbonate, um, and, uh, and low total hardness. So um, Pilsner profile. Pilsner profile. There you go. All, All right. right. And that is our beer of the week. So uh, rate on a scale of one to 12, how likely you are to do an Italian grape ale in the next year. Boom. Right now in the comments. Do it. Also hit the like button. Hit that likes. We're up to 34. We're a third of the way to our goal. There you go. Um, all right, let's go on to topic number one, which is common mistakes of new and old home brewers. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to break down things that we see people doing a lot that you may or may not do, but even if you don't yeah. already do these mistakes, hopefully you'll learn something. And I tried to list these in, honestly, a relative order of uh, most common to least common, too. Um, so do keep that in mind when you're listening in today, um, because I think you might be surprised at... Uh, you know, which ones are actually of more importance or happen more than, than others do. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, let's get right into it. Um, Peter, I mean, I feel like we're beating a dead horse here, but yeah. <laughs> um, bad water. So starting with bad water is something we see people do a lot and we see people of all ranges do it. Um, a lot of times people will go from like, maybe they'll move, uh, and just, they'll have a different house. And they won't really re even think to check this. Uh, yeah. but that is just having bad water to start with, which can come from things in your pipes. It can come from your water source itself. Uh, and a lot of times it just has to do with chlorine being in your water before you mash in. Yeah. Um, for one, make sure your water tastes good. If you don't want to like sit there and drink several cups of water, um, why would you put it in your beer? You know, I can't tell you how many people are like, oh, yeah, I live out in Liberty Lake. The water's terrible. I don't drink it. And then they go and brew a batch of beer. With yeah. And they're like, why is this pseudo plastic -y flavor? In my uh, beer? Yeah. So. Um, so, yeah. So make sure it tastes good. Make sure it looks good. You know, if it's like I know out at my house, I've had issues with rust before. Yeah. Um, so if you look in your bucket and you don't have nice, you know, clear water to work with, you probably shouldn't be putting that in your beer. Um, and then also, yeah, chlorine. Chlorine is the number one uh, thing that we see people come in, and uh, usually that's going to be with extract batches. Um, and what what people don't realize is, uh, you know, we say that we don't worry about chlorine so much here. I know it's in our water, um, but what happens is as you heat that water up to mash in with, um, you're volatizing that chlorine. By the time you get it up to 150 degrees or so. Um, there's virtually no chlorine left in there. That is specific to diatomic um, chlorine, which is what our, per, our water source uses. A lot of other places, especially I, I know places like Arizona, uh, with different sources of water, use yeah. chloramines, uh, which are a more stable compound and will not volatilize, which means you have to either get, it, get rid of it with metabisulfite or just use a carbon filter to get rid of your chlorine or just buy neutral water to begin with. Yeah. Um, and then what happens though is people, you know, don't realize that and they'll, you know, use just water straight out of their sink to top off their extract batches with. Um, and at that point you're crossing, you know, even a gallon of, of top off water is really crossing that threshold yeah. um, of, of flavor. And uh, you end up with a very plasticky taste to the beer. Yeah. So what happens, so. especially when, uh, uh, let's say you mash it at a low temperature and your chlorine has not volatilized or you have chloramines in your beer, or if you are just uh, mixing in uh, DME with uh, your um, with your chlorinated water before heating it all the way up, uh, you create compounds called, cl uh, called chlorophenols, which are uh, stable compounds that will not volatilize from your beer. And as soon as they're in there, it's kind of a, they're going to be in there until the beer is beer. Um, and so you'll taste that in the final product, even though it happens right at the beginning of your beer. It's going to be in there until the beer is urine. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So number one thing that we run into is bad water and more specifically, uh, with chlorine contamination at some point, get a filter um, or just, you know, tr I mean, we trust our water. So if you know your water is good, don't worry about it. But yeah. if you move or if you're brewing at somebody's house, uh, make sure that you're tasting your water. You have a good idea of what is in there that can be affecting your beer. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and keep this in mind too. Like that's also why we tell people, you know, basically avoid, 
um, using bleach on any of your equipment at, at all costs too, because it can actually have that same effect. Um, you know, if you, if you, even in a glass carboy, if you put bleach in there and don't do like a quadruple rinse, um, you know, a drop of, of, uh, of concentrated bleach will completely ruin a batch of beer. So yeah, that, that low of a flavor <coughs> threshold. Um, so yeah, that's, that's water for you. Um, so let's go on to number two that we see, um, very commonly, um, more specifically in the spring and summer months. Um, so this is going to be uh, hot fermentations, and we're really talking just in general about overall fermentation temperatures. Uh, but why, the, why we start with hot fermentations is because a lot of people get used to as starting home brewers brewing at room temperature, 68 to 72 degrees, depending on how your house is. Um, and uh, they just get used to that because there's a lot of generic beer styles that you make as a fledgling home brewer that that fermentation temperature works in. So that's 68 to 72. Uh, when in reality, your temperature that you're fermenting at is very yeast dependent and most yeasts, if you're making a clean beer, actually like to be below that somewhere in the 64 to 66 range. Uh, and with a lot of common yeast, even as low as 60, if you want a nice clean beer. Yeah, so, um, so it's something that you actually have to keep in mind, um, that and the free rise in a fermenter too. An active fermentation is going to increase that temperature, um, you know, five, even six degrees sometimes above the ambient temperature. Um, so, yeah, that's why, you know, our general recommendation is always shoot for the low end of the temperature range um, unless you're doing, you know, certain quike strains, which is the beauty nowadays is that we do have a lot of yeast strains um, that are very, very, you know, tolerant of a wide temperature range. Um, and produce clean beer regardless. Yeah, your um, quike strains, your Belgian strains, your Saison strains, uh, and even some IPA strains like Citrus and Barbarian can stand that warmer temperature. Yep. Um, but uh, so when it comes to when it comes to IPAs, though, something you got to balance with that is if you are fermenting on the hotter side, usually your yeast is going to rip, and there can be a lot of uh, aromatic stripping, basically. So your yeast, because it's rumbling so fast and it's fermenting so hot, um, actually getting rid of a lot of the aromatics that you want in your IPA. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and the most common thing that you'll see if your fermentation does get too hot um, is you'll start getting, I call them sort of the overripe rotten fruit notes yeah. um, in there. So you'll get like this, like, y you might get some banana, you might get some like overripe peach or plum type um, f uh, aromatics coming off of it. And those can also hold, hold through, through the flavor. Yes, Peter's figuring out how to turn a volume down. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, that's going to be the common uh, issue with fermentations that run a little bit too hot for uh, the yeast strain. Um, yeah, and you can also run into issues um, from fermenting too cold. Um, that's pretty, that's specifically with uh, English yeast strains come to mind, um, which usually happens this time of year. Yeah. Um, is people people kind of get stuck fermentations um, or, or, or they real, get diacetyl. Yeah, or diacetyl or sluggish fermentations. Um, and that's from fermenting too cold. You know, if you've got an English yeast strain that you throw down in your basement, and now that we're, you know, getting well below freezing um, in the evening times, you know, it might be dropping down um, below 60 degrees. It might be 55 degrees down there. Um, now and uh, and yeah, especially English strains um, really like to drop out. So if you're on a cold crash, um, your beer that's probably a great way to do it. Um, but uh, at the same time, um, it means that they're going to struggle to finish up, um, which can end up with bottle bombs um, or can just end up with a beer that doesn't actually fin attenuate fully. So someone's asking, what can you do about high bicarbonate, like over 250 ppm? I mean, besides filtering, the easiest thing to do is add a little bit of acid to your strike water and boil it before you strike. Yeah. So um, yeah it'll there, precipitate out. If there's calcium in there, it'll precipitate out. Yeah, there is a process called slaking um, that you, you can do, um, which means that you, like Peter said, um, add a little acid, um, boil it, and then you actually let it cool back off before you use it, and you'll see that precipitate out. Um, but honestly, in my opinion, that's a lot of work, and it's a lot easier to just straight up dilute it down with yeah, still water. Yeah. <laughs> spend spend uh, you know three bucks uh, on five gallons of water, and then you can dilute. Um, anyway, let's go on to number three. And this happens. We see this happen a lot. You probably haven't heard us talk about it too much. Uh, but let's say <laughs> someone's building your grain bill. They're scooping grains into your entire grain bill. Um, and then one of their scoops is just right next to a bag of crystal malt. And that crystal malt happened to have a couple of kernels. Uh, get into the bag that they're scooping out of and those kernels get into your beer. Um, uh, yeah, so number three is using too much crystal malt. Yeah, we see this over and over again. And, uh, you know, my only theory behind it is that it's an old school approach to <clears throat> 30 years ago when it was base malts and crystal malts and heavily roasted malts. 
and that was kind of all we had available. But nowadays, there's literally hundreds of malt varieties out there to work with um, that have so much better flavor profiles than crystal malt, um, which means that you don't have to use crystal malt in beer. And I do so. think this is a, it's also probably a stylistic change. I think a lot of times um, crystal malts were a really good way to also cover up, uh, you know, fruity fermentations, for the lack of a better word, or fermentations that have a lot of off flavors or not off flavors, but less dis or more distracting flavors. Yeah. Um, these days we're used to a crisp, clear beer. So I think the, the overall palate of most people has changed. We like things that are bright and acidic, or if they're supposed to be sweet, we like a lot of maturity to come with that sweetness. So um, crystal malts themselves don't need to go in every beer and definitely for a five gallon in that range or 2019 liter um, batch two pounds is excessive for most beers when we see a lot of people that have that two pound or more in their recipes yeah definitely um, and so yeah just general overuse of that um, it makes for sweet fruity beers so I guess if you're going for that then then you do you but uh, but you know a lot of times you know we'll see that in like a west coast IPA and yeah. you're like, that's, that's, a, that's not a West Coast IPA. So um, All Star yeah. says, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned and used crystal malt for 20% <laughs> of my grist. Um, that's okay. Just do, just do eight Hail Marys. Yeah, I was uh, like, I was like by, Marys. by that, I mean just like <laughs> take a can of beer and chuck it across your yard and hope someone catches it. Um, <laughs> and then you should be okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. What do you guys suggest to substitute for a crystal malt in an Irish red? Uh, depending on the crystal malt, let's say you have a pound of C60, for example. I would use a half a pound of Special X instead. Yeah, Special X, uh, Red X, just using, as a yeah, using Red base X. Malt. Build, you know, just building different layers. Even Cara Munich, which is kind of like a half crystal, half yeah. Munich. Cara Vienna, um, yeah, um, even in there. there. There's there's so many options. That's that's. that's if I only guess. there was like a whole video that went over <laughs> the different substitutions you can use. Uh, yeah, and it really is a tip of the iceberg. Cara uh, Steen, golly, yeah, yeah. Oh, I might sneeze. Oh, don't, it might happen. Don't do it. Oh. Don't do it. Get away from me. Um, all right. Okay. Okay. Anyway, and uh, so on to number four. Number four is uh, not knowing what sediment is okay in a fermenter. So I know a lot of people will ask us if it's uh, good to throw their hops in just into the boil, uh, or they, should they bag it and then put the bag in the boil? Uh, and that has to do with hop utilization. So I'm not going to go too much into that. The biggest thing is when you go from the boil kettle into your fermenter. When is it more appropriate to strain and filter out, and when is it not appropriate? Uh, the answer is for most lighter beers without a lot of heavy adjuncts and without a lot of hops. All that. Can go in the fermenter and actually create a fine fermentation some yeah. of the byproducts uh, from uh, uh, boiling um, and coagulating your proteins in the boil will actually help your yeast ferment during fermentation yeah. so if you get all of it gone it's not necessarily going to hurt but it's not necessarily going to help either uh, that said if you have a really high adjunct beer and there's a lot of those proteins that are sedimenting down or if you have a lot of hop troop in there that can actually start damaging your beer by creating grassy notes from the hop structure or uh, basically creating too much coverage of your yeast as it flocculates out and making it so that your yeast uh, uh, are more likely to precipitate before they're finishing, finished their fermenting. Yep. So, um, so yeah, general rule of thumb, if you got a real um, high adjunct, high hopped beer, um, then consider some kind of straining or some kind of, you know, whirlpooling mechanism to, to try to separate some of that material out. Or use um, an oversized bag. Not a hop spider, not a tiny little bag that you just kind of dangle in there, but like a bag that's like half the size of your kettle and yeah. lets it roll around in there. Big, big bags. Um, or, a, I mean, I guess you could do a big hop spider too, but they generally <laughs> don't make them that big. Crystal for president 2020. <laughs> make America malt again. Oh, God. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so um, if, it's a, if it's a lighter beer with a lower hop load, uh, don't worry about it. Take the whole thing and dump it in. It'll be just fine. Um, all right, and on to number five, which is not enough hops in IPAs or just using the wrong hop varieties, right? Yeah, we got a recipe just this last week, and this happens all the time. Uh, and usually they're older recipes from one of our competitors that yeah. are written out on a sheet of paper. I'm not going to name names. But it had like three ounces of hops in it. I mean, one of them was a really high alpha hop, and it was in there early, but it was like three ounces of hops yeah. total. And while that technically might get you the bitterness to be in an IPA range, in today's hop-heavy world, that's not an IPA. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could take uh, something like Millennium and throw in, in a five-gallon batch, what, three-quarters of an ounce and get an IPA that's uh, 60 IBUs? Yeah. With, with three-quarters of an ounce. Technically in the right uh, Te range. Technically, yeah. It was like technically it would be a bitter beer. 
but just that's, with no flavor. But yeah, but that's more the the, the <laughs> barley wine esque or the strong ale esque kind of style. Uh -huh. We're really still leaning into malt characters. Generally speaking, they're going to be higher alcohol um, by their nature. Uh, it doesn't really make sense unless you're doing. Uh, it doesn't really make sense for a light beer, honestly, to do some, something like that. Um, but IPAs are designed to be hoppy, and hoppy and bitterness are way two different things. Yep, exactly. So yeah, and I think that's the big thing is <laughs> understanding the difference between um, hop flavor and just general bitterness. And uh, yeah, so like Peter said, we see a lot of people that come through um, with IPAs, and you know they're throwing you know two ounces, three ounces of hops at, at these beers. And the reality is, um, you know, for even for say a Northwest IPA that should be a little bit more balanced. Um, for a five-gallon batch, you're looking at probably at least four or five ounces of hops in there. For West Coast, um, you're looking at closer to a half pound. Um, and for hazies, they might even be eight or 12 ounces. Um, so, you know, we're talking about a lot more hops than most people are used to. Yes, that does add cost to the beer. Um, but, I mean, let's be real. Uh, the difference between, you know, a pint of beer that you're drinking at home, if that pint of beer is costing you, you know, 35 cents versus 45 cents, um, on the big picture, is that really a big deal? You know, when you're spending an extra ten or fifteen dollars on a recipe. I think your scales off. I think so. it's probably more like for most homebrewers doing an IPA, it's probably a difference between like ninety cents a pint and a dollar fifty a pint. Is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Fine. Math, Logan. Math. Math. Okay. Whatever. Either way, it's way cheaper than any any solid beer that you're gonna get from a brewery. And so. the world is your oyster with hops, and so if you see Cascade in there, Cascade's actually a really hard hop to make shine in an IPA. It's more of a balancing hop. Uh, however, there are depending on the styles of hops that you want, a lot of hops that are gonna be assertive and aggressive. Um, so that means not overusing things like Willamette and Goldings and those lower uh, flavor hops using things that are big like Columbus, Chinook for West Coast and Northwest, like Simcoe, Mosaic for those hazies or tropicals or anything in between. Yeah. Um, and just picking your hops that are designed to have big flavors. Yeah, so. honestly, Mosaic's probably a little bit overused because Mosaic, when you combine it with like too many hops is a good example, uh, can actually just sort of muddle up the flavors of things. Um, yeah. Someone says Whirlpool 170 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 ounces of hops instead of dry hopping. Sure. Yeah. Uh, no, we've literally we, done yeah. that on some of our best <laughs> IPAs that we've made have just been yeah. um, solely giant Whirlpool editions, and it ends up working out yeah, really it, well. It, uh, it makes it so that you're, you're not reaching that threshold with getting the bitterness too high because it's going to take a long time to get the bitterness, even though you have tremendous amounts of hops in there. But you will get enough, and then all that flavor is just going to soak into the beer. Uh, but also because you're Whirlpooling, you are getting rid of that grassy material, and so all the uh, volatile aromatics are in there at the start of fermentation so you can reduce uh, like harsher terpenes like a geraniol lineal. Uh, and so you can make it so it's going to be a softer, more stable fruit bomb of a beer in the yep. final product. Exactly. Yeah, no, pretty much we've had like four or five different random recipes that um, turn out way better than we expect when we're just like, oh, yeah, we lost track of time. Here, dump a pound of this in there. All right, <laughs> call it a day. Yeah, uh, we just get distracted by working out front. We're like, oh, we've got to finish this beer. Um, so, all right, and on to the next one. What do we got here? Uh, number six is uh, aiming for too high of an alcohol. Yeah. Um, while it is tempting um, as a home brewer to just make every beer super boozy and super high alcohol, um, it's, it is uh, a hard risk. And you don't. So yeah. when you get up to, I mean, honestly, eight percent is probably that kind of threshold where you really start having to have proper technique even to make the beer right in the first place. When you start getting above nine, almost 10%, you really have to start getting into coaxing your yeast along and creating a proper environment for everything to ferment nearly perfectly. Or else, even if you do produce a fine enough beer at the end, you're going to have some volatiles. You're going to have some off or some uh, harsher off flavors, um, some, uh, some jet fuel flavors maybe. Um, yeah, which we've tasted quite a few times. Yeah. Uh, some jet fuel um, and uh, especially people that come in and they're making 10% beer and they insist on only having one pack of USO5 every time. And yeah. you're just like, you're like, it's probably going to finish out, but it's going to taste like jet fuel. <laughs> if, you're, if you're watching today, you know who you are. <laughs> you guys out there. Hail Marys all around. No. Hail Marys. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but uh, you definitely need... Whoa, I'm way behind on this. Uh, you definitely need proper coaxing when you're up in that nine plus percent range. Um, and that's going to take, you know, uh, when you go too, much, go too much above that, that's even going to take things like double pitching, adding nutrients, um, yeast rousing, yeah. uh, oxygenating multiple days in a row, uh, things like that, that to really properly get a 
a suitable product at the end that is actually in balance. Yeah, and that, and that's I guess the biggest thing is it's like most people just think of it as well. It's the beer finished, right? It's fine. Yeah. Um, but it's but it's all those. Final gravity. There's so many other off flavors and, and issues you can run into between um, the, you know, between just having the beer finished and actually having a really tasty high alcohol beer. Let's uh, since we're kind of already going into that, let's lump this in with number seven, which is going to be poor yeast health. Um, so we've talked about that from the perspective of a higher alcohol beer where you really need to be coaxing your yeast. Uh, but let's talk about like that medium range beer where you might feel comfortable always pitching that one pack of USO5. We always, 100% of the time, recommend a yeast starter. And that's not to say that your yeast won't do its job if you don't make a yeast starter. But what you don't realize is how inconsistent your beer can be just by not starting your yeast before you add it to your beer. Yeah, so an important step is just kind of getting those yeast out of their sort of hibernation phase, um, getting them through what's called the lag phase, which they just sort of hang out, um, absorb some goodies before they start going ham on your beer. Before the um, growth, before they log. Yep, exactly. They lag before they log, guys. Yeah, lags and logs. Um, but um, yeah, and just really getting them ready to hit that wort running. Um, and, and doing that will definitely, for one, you're going to see like crazy fast uh, fermentation Starts. Um, starts, yeah, exactly, um, to the point where it's not like, oh, yeah, pitch this, and then it should be going the next day. It's like, pitch this, you're going to go have a beer and come back, and it'll be fermenting. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it, it is that big of a difference. Um, but then, yeah, it just, it just keeps that consistency. It's an easy thing to do. Um, you can even do it right in your fermenter the day before, um, which is sort of a hack that you don't even necessarily have to have a, you know, a flask with a stir plate on. You can do a one-liter starter right in your primary fermenter um, you know just sanitize it like you normally would pitch that starter right right in there the day before and then rack your beer right on top of it so people think of um, that lag and start just in terms of infection they're like well if everything's sanitized it should be fine if it takes two or three days to get started and while that's technically true there's a lot of other things that are going on in your beer for example with the oxygen in the headspace or something called or in the beer itself because you should be oxygenating your beer there's something called reactive oxidant species that can be made in those actually reduced shelf stability and they can cause um, harsher flavors or sometimes they can lead to oxidation down the road even though you don't expect it because um, it creates different compounds that are going to uh, basically wildly attack um, any substrates. So uh, there's other things that happen besides just infection. Perfect. All right. Um, speaking of oxidization, uh, that is going to be number eight on, oh, we have 12. I thought we were doing 10. Yeah. You added some. Of course uh, I added some. <laughs> when do I not add some? And, uh, <laughs> and that is oxidization and hazy IPAs. Uh, you know, people come in here all the time. Um, they try one of the hazy IPAs we have on tap. They go, oh, man, this beer is awesome. I want to brew it. Um, we build them up a recipe, send them home with it, and they come back and they go, it's okay, but it just doesn't taste the same as yours. And they bring us back a beer that's purple and gray or brown colored um, when they should be really, really pale. Um, look like orange juice, right? And while it, yeah, while technically it's not bad beer, it's you know a flavor that we've definitely trained ourselves to throw up when we taste. Um, and, uh, that is, it's basically the same thing as eating a brown banana. Like, you know, there's that, yeah. there's that right freshness of a banana and you can eat a brown banana, but it's also kind of squishy and kind of fruity and you don't, you don't really like it, but you don't know why. <laughs> Peter just likes bananas. That's true. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, I think uh, it's the shape. Yeah. So ultimately it, it comes down to oxidization. Um, at some point, um, during the fermentation process or packaging process, um, you're allowing um, oxygen into, uh, into contact with the beer and, uh, and anything that has really high hop loads in it for the most part um, is going to suffer from this. Um, what it's going to do is it's actually going to deteriorate all those nice hop aromatics and all those really nice hoppy flavors um, very, very quickly and, uh, and, yeah, and then turn the beer into you know, a, a sort of... A brown of, banana. Yeah, a brown banana. <laughs> It's going to turn your beer into a brown banana, guys. Don't let it do it. Uh, uh, so and this actually has to go back to reactive oxidant species and different uh, compounds that they make just by their nature of their existence. It's not always direct oxygen on hop compounds. It's intermediary compounds that are made uh, earlier on in the brew process that can actually attack these hop compounds and uh, turn them into that, yep. that mushiness, which so. is why we use ascorbic acid. Yep. So ascorbic acid is something that we use in every hop forward beer, every pale beer, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, so that's always a good tool. Um, also, there is a process called um, low-dose, low-dissolved oxygen um, uh, fermentation. 
and uh, I believe we've done a video on that. So do a do a search for Lodo on YouTube. I'm sure you'll see our video. You'll probably see a couple others pop up, um, and that's a really important uh, method to use whenever you're brewing a real um, hot forward hazy beer. Yeah. So uh, cover everything in an argon blanket, and you should be good. Uh, argon. Everyone has argon. Everyone has argon. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, Let's go on to number nine. Number nine. Number nine. That number is, nine. this is more for our beginner home brewers. It's not going to be as applicable to everybody else, but uh, we can talk about some other things that might be applicable. Uh, this is going to be scorched malt extract, and this is specific to liquid malts. Um, basically, when you have your kettle on a burner, that bottom of the kettle is very hot, and uh, when you add liquid malt extract to that, it likes to sink. Yeah, so just like any you know thick syrup that you're gonna add to something, uh, you got to make sure that doesn't scorch. If it does, it produces a really strong burnt flavor, um, and that's not gonna leave the beer. And uh, I've definitely tasted a lot of scorched beers, yep. and and like Peter said, usually this is a really kind of new home home brewer rookie mistake, um, so to speak of. Uh, but even I've I've actually done it even like knowing it. Yeah. Um, and so it is something to be aware of. Something that you really got to make sure like you take whatever you're cooking in off the heat for you know a few minutes honestly to make it get fully dissolved um, to, like uh, when we did our uh, partial had a partial mass beer guide to hefe with a befa yeah that Which one one of our best videos you guys should go watch it it's super awesome so um yeah but yeah so um make sure that you don't scorch any liquid malt extract um if and when um, you do use it. So. There, there are other ways to scorch, and we'll kind of just run through these really quick. Uh, if you have a non-triclad kettle or if you have a highly heat-conductive kettle and a hot burner, uh, you can actually scorch your regular beer too. This can come from high hopping. If those hops are circulating around, every once in a while you can get burn, uh, burnt hops. That's the easiest way that I see that happen on the commercial scale because um, things actually uh, boil at a hotter temperature on the commercial scale. Yeah. Um, and even if you just have a really thick beer, uh, if you have hot spots in your kettle, if you're getting that, uh, that brown ring or that burnt looking ring in the bottom of your kettle, you might consider lowering your burner um, just to make sure that it's having time to even out throughout the kettle or just investing in a tri-clad kettle. Yeah, so definitely, um, yeah, on a commercial scale, um, you might actually have that kind of scorch flavor come through a little bit differently because usually it's not like, it's not like super obvious, but it's almost, um, I've tasted it as almost like a grain husky character sometimes. To me, um, so I'm super sensitive to scorch. To me, it tastes a lot like when you add way too many bittering hops to an IPA. Yeah. So yeah, it can be that. It can be grain husky. Sometimes it's like a burnt marshmallow. So if it is like a burnt marshmallow, they went way over the top with it. Um, so, all right. And on to number 10. Uh, and that is uh, shooting for too high of mash temperatures. Yes. Uh, most uh, most grain uh, grains these days are actually uh, either highly modified or highly bred to be specific for brewing. Uh, that said, you can very, very easily get a wide range of what they can be, what you get off of your grains if you uh, mash at, let's say, 145 Fahrenheit versus 155 Fahrenheit. Yeah, there's no reason with, a, you know, even a moderate amount of adjunct load um, why, why your beers uh, shouldn't be hitting, you know, close to 80%, if not higher, um, attenuation. And, uh, and the only reason why we see uh, people that come in and they're either getting, you know, real low brew house efficiencies uh, or they're getting poor attenuation is usually because their mash temps um, are way too high. Um, and I, I think, again, this just falls into that sort of old school thinking category. Yeah. Um, and you see, you know, I see people come in there they're rest and I ask them what their mash temp was when they're like, yeah, this beer only went down to, you know, 10, 15, 10, 20. And, uh, and ultimately they're mashing in at like 158 degrees, um, which is really just way too high. You're going to denature a lot of those important enzymes very quickly at those temperatures. Um, we generally don't recommend going, you know, even 155 is probably the highest I would ever try to mash in. Yeah, both, uh, so. both alpha and beta amylase are denaturing at 155 degrees. Alpha is slower than beta, um, but beta amylase will denature pretty fast at that temperature. Uh, the starting temperature range for beta to denature is actually in the 140s. Yeah. Uh, but that said, the rate of denaturation versus the rate of uh, the enzyme actually doing its job, um, that's, it'll still do its thing. Um, but uh, yeah, going up to 154, you're definitely losing a lot of your beta amylase, which is going to cleave your, uh, cleave your starches in a way that makes it easier for your alpha amylase to do its job. 
Um, so we actually recommend always mashing in super low. Yeah. Uh, and then if you want 45 to about 150. Yeah, that's a really great range. And then if you want to make a thicker beer, it's super easy to adjust your grain bill to do that. And it's also a more consistent way to make a recipe. Yeah, exactly. It keeps her consistent beers. It keeps for a little bit drier beers um, and kind of allows the yeah, allows that recipe building itself to come through versus the, the mashing temperature, I guess, is the big thing there. Um, and I think there only there is one sort of uh, caveat to the high mash temps. Uh, actually, there's two I can think of now. Um, and one of them is if you are trying to brew a like true sour ale that you're gonna have Britannomyces and kind of a mixed fermentation going on, you know, doing a really high mash temperature so that you don't have those, um, you know, real easy fermentables in there might actually work out for the long run for something that you might be fermenting for, you know, a year or two um, and, and allowing those diastaticus uh, yeast strains or Brettanomyces to, to really chew on. Um, and then the second occasion would be if you're specifically trying to make a low gravity or low alcohol beer, um, not necessarily gravity, um, just because you're going to have a higher um, final gravity, lower attenuation and less alcohol. So Just use 40 percent oatmeal. 40% oatmeal. All right, All let's go on to number 11. I see a couple of questions popping up and we'll definitely get to some of those in a little bit. But uh, number 11 is actually adjusting your carbonation levels. This yep. is something that has, has a tremendous impact on styles of beer. And there are even some styles of beer that we recommend people bottle condition at a lower carbonation uh, just to get the full maturity or the full flavor of what the beer is supposed to taste like. Um, so carbonation levels for different styles of beer should be different. And one of the reasons of that is because uh, uh, carbon dioxide not only dissolves into the beer and forms bubbles and carbonation, uh, but it also isomerizes into um, I summarize, what's the right word for that? It turns into a carbonic acid, which carbonic acid is an acid that you can taste and it affects the flavor of the beer. Now that acidity can push forward bright flavors like citrus flavors, something that you might want in a Hefeweizen, which is gonna be highly carbonated or even IPAs. So um, yeah, and I think the biggest takeaway here is to realize that levels of carbonation in beer, um, they- They're like, an ingredient. By, yeah, they are an ingredient and by the number, they actually, uh, a very small change in something like priming sugar or the pressure that the beer is served at or even carbonated at um, can actually have a really, really big difference in the level of carbonation on the beer. Um, so your actually par actual parts of carbonation vary a, ver a real small amount for a very noticeable level in how fizzy that beer really is. Um, so yeah, my general rule of thumb for um, bottling is to do one ounce of dextrose sugar uh, for every gallon of, of uh, a finished beer that you're using, but the difference of one ounce in one direction might mean, um, or say, say you're doing a five gallon batch, um, if you do four ounces of sugar instead of five ounces of sugar, you actually have a beer that's on the pretty low end of carbonation, and if you do six ounces of sugar, you actually have a very high, highly carbonated beer. So that kind of hopefully puts things into perspective of, of how a very small change and your priming sugar can really affect the carbonation. Everyone in the comments, please name your favorite highly carbonated style and your favorite lowly carbonated style. Perfect. All right. Uh, and then very lastly, almost <laughs> lastly, yeah, on the very last. Uh, Lastiferousness. Lastiferous almost didn't make the list, which everybody likes to jump to, right? Yeah. Um, and that is actual infection. Um, infection, as you can now probably figure out, is a very, very rare occurrence in beer. That's usually because we're throwing lots of healthy yeast cells at it if you're doing things right. Um, but it can happen. It can come through as... Um, being band aid -y. it can come through as bottle bombs, um, it can come through in a really wide variety of things, um, but like we mentioned here, I think it's just more, um, more of, a, of a practice than anything else. Most um, people get into home brewing with the understanding that you should sanitize a lot of things. That said, as long as you're using clean for, uh, equipment and you have good yeast health, uh, infections are relatively rare, especially in the time frame that you are drinking your beer. If you're making a beer and you're drinking it within five weeks and you had a healthy yeast and you used clean equipment, not necessarily even sanitized, but clean equipment, there is a good chance that your beer will not get infected. So, yeah. So anyway, th I think the big thing there is just infection is probably the last thing you should look for if you are having any kind of off flavors with your beer and yet everybody likes to jump to it. So, um, yeah, keep things clean, you know, keep things clean and uh, just use common sense with that. 
All right. Well, let's go on to topic number two. Wow, we are just kind of burning through the the day today. So yeah, everybody, um, we need uh, seven more likes. We're at sixty two likes, so we need seven more likes, and then no more after that. And then no more after that. Uh, so topic number two uh, is going to be uh, partial mashing, and this is kind of a fun one. Um, it's something that uh, we hear a lot of people sort of interested in and honestly it's a practice that's not done enough in my opinion yeah um, and, and that is uh, and what partial mashing is is um, it's sort of that bridge between extract and all grain brewing uh, most extract brewers will um, have what are called steeping grains with their beer recipes and uh, what extract mashing does or extract um, partial mashing does is it takes that up a notch um, so um, to put things into perspective, what a partial mash is, is you're going to have those same steeping grains that might be a pound or two, um, and you're going to be adding, um, you know, anywhere from like three to five pounds of base malt to where you're actually, you know, have a little bit larger bag in your kettle, and, uh, and you're actually going to be doing a mash rest um, just like you would with all grain brewing, just on a smaller scale. This might be a good idea if you are, let's say, trying to make a larger batch than your kettle size actually fits. Um, we do this, uh, we've actually done this on the commercial, the large scale, um, because we have a five barrel fermenter and our biggest boiling kettle is 50 gallons. So, uh, what this might mean is let's say you only have a five gallon kettle and you're trying to make a five or five and a half gallon batch of beer. A partial ma mash might be a good way to get everything that you want off of a mash, all the flavors from your grains and everything, um, but then be able to increase the density of your boiled liquid at the very end of the boil uh, and then uh, dilute out to the full volume. This also might be a good idea if you have, uh, if you're set up for. Um, five gallons of brewing, but you want to make a 10 gallon batch of beer, uh, or if you're set up for doing a 10 gallon batch and you want to make 15 gallons of beer for to split off into uh, different experiments, maybe you want to try three different yeasts or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's so what it really does um, is it gives you a lot more control um, that you don't really necessarily have when you're just using extracts. Um, and I think um, the biggest thing when it comes to control. Um, is, uh, is actually probably the fact that you can get drier beers from it that you just can't get with using malt extract, right? Exactly, yeah. So uh, malt extract has a set fermentability. It's always 75% fermentable, uh, meaning you will always leave 25% of your thickness behind. Um, this works out pretty well in that 10... Uh, yeah, 1050 to 1060 OG range because you're going to end up right in that 1012 to 1015 final gravity. Uh, but when you get into higher alcohol beers or if you just want to make a, you know, a sessionable beer that finishes a little bit drier, um, then you have to either partial mash or start working with some enzymes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, mm. partial mash, um, it's going to help you dry out your beer. And um, a lot in a way that it does that is that you have that. Um, just like we mentioned in our first topic, that control over your mash temperatures. Um, and like we recommend, um, you know, 145 to 150 degree mash temperatures um, will give you a, you know, fermentable wort if you have, you know, a fair amount of base malt in it um, of probably, you know, 85% fermentability there or even 90% um, depending on the malts that you're using. So um, that's really going to help kind of supplement any extract that you might have in there, have the beer finish out drier. Um, and uh, making an overall just kind of more, more sessionable, more drinkable beer. Um, you also, uh, compared to going complete extract, a partial match is going to be relatively cheaper, um, and it's going to lower your risk of stale ingredients. Yeah. Um, and then uh, next off, too, uh, is, is actually the increase of, of what flavors you can get from ingredients. Uh, we had someone come in last week, and they wanted a Maris Otter, uh, uh, dry malt extract and and I can't get Maris Otter dry malt extract, but I do have Maris Otter malt um, So, you know, that's kind of was my suggestion was to actually do a partial mash um, And using you know four or five pounds of Maris Otter um, To actually do a small mini mash or partial mash with um, you can get the flavor you're looking for and then just supplement the rest of your sugars um, with some kind of a, a pale malt extract so Someone's asking if my spoken word poem is going to be, uh, if it's, if I already have thought about what it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> and, and no, the answer is I, I am not prepared to do a spoken word poem. I'm actually kind of getting a little scared now that we're up at 81 likes. So <laughs> <laughs> we're getting there. Keep it coming guys. 
Keep it coming. Um, All right, yeah. some drawbacks. If you're doing a, let's say you are doing a uh, partial mash so that you can get that full volume. Let's say you're doing, you have your 10 gallon setup that you're working with and you want to make 15 gallons of beer. So you decide to do partial mash and add some extracts. Um, might be a little bit obvious to some of you, but maybe not to others. The partial mash will lower your hop utilization. Hop utilization is dependent on boiled wort density. So if you're adding extracts to that, um, I usually recommend adding that towards the end of the boil. Um, what that's going to do is for the majority of your boil, uh, you're going to have a lower dense liquid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so your hop, especially your bittering hops, will be a little bit more consistent. Yeah. And also that will um, help with really pale colored beers, um, which is also another actually benefit, I guess, to um, <coughs> doing partial mashing is that you could use something like Heidelberg malt and actually end up with a nice pale colored Pilsner, um, which is otherwise kind of difficult to achieve. Um, if you're using all malt extract and um, just because of that natural darkening from that condensed boil so um, and then uh, so you mentioned about that and did you mention the hops uh, yeah I mentioned lower hop utilization lower hop utilization and then I guess the only other drawback to it is that it actually takes a little bit more time because you do have to go through instead of doing maybe a 20 or 30 minute steep with um, your grains you're actually going to do that full hour mash to try to convert as much sugars as possible and get those into uh, your beer. So that is, I think we're going to leave it there for our second topic, which is partial mashing. Um, throw some questions out. Looks like, I think we missed a couple things, but we are trying to kind of get on to our general questioning because we are starting to run out of time here, actually. Yeah, we got about uh, 10 minutes left, so let's see what all Q&As we can get through. All right. Uh, I saw one about halfway through the comments earlier. Ch -ch -ch. Where's that? Where's that pet fly? Uh, where was that one? Oh, someone asked how my birthday was. Thanks for asking, Penguin. My birthday was good. I got to uh, work most of it, but not all of it. So I gave him a hand. Job. Peter. What? <laughs> uh, da -da -da -da. Ah, we're in 96. No. no. Stop it. Nah, <laughs> Peter's doing a spoken word. Uh. Uh, somebody said, oh, here's a good one. Options for Mosaic. Cost shot up big time. Um, so I'm guessing they're, they're asking about uh, basically hop varietals that would uh, substitute for Mosaic. Um, ah, we got there. Okay, we'll do, <laughs> before we close out, we'll do a spoken word poem. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I would say Mosaic substitutes, uh, in my mind right now, I feel like Pato is a reasonable one. Pato's a little bit more, it's like aggressive. It's like a halfway uh, northwesty uh, you got to go fruity like you got to go a combination of like simcoe and uh like equinot or yeah. idaho seven or something you can like definitely that. hit like, it with multiple hot varieties that's but, what I'll, oh yeah, yeah i'll just find blends of things that are super fruity and kind of dance around the uh yeah there was uh what was another one that was kind of on that herbal side and and to put this like out there too for everyone mosaic is actually one of the uh is, is a hop variety that varies wildly from crop year to crop year. Um, it honestly is probably one of the most inconsistent varieties that, that uh, I've ever seen when it comes to just overall flavor profile. Um, and I think that comes down to the oil content too. So, um, so yeah, always, always take that into consideration. Um, and really you're just kind of looking for a blended oil content. That's what mosaic tends to carry so you can do that with you know just throw the kitchen sink at it a fruity hops yeah throw the kitchen sink a little at bit it. of belma a little bit of galaxy a little bit of uh simcoe just throw it all out there. there is another one though that i'm thinking it's the blueberry flavor that's kind of hard to get to but yeah but uh oh, man do you see more sediment going into the fermenters with quike brews since you don't chill as low um no not necessarily actually a lot of that has to do not only with uh, chill speed um, but with how you boil and also your grain. Um, so it's kind of hard to put them side by side because, you know, let's say I do a, a, a hundred percent two row beer. That's going to have a lot less sediment going into the fermenter, regardless of chill speed than if I'm doing like a 30% adjunct beer. Yeah. Oh, cashmere was the other one that kind of came to that was, yeah, a little bit more herbal one. Yeah. That one was a little bit more herbal. So yeah, I feel like, yeah, maybe a blend of, maybe a blend of both of those Pato and cashmere, a little 50, 50, you could probably get really close to a mosaic profile. Larry Stuber, if I want to make a five-gallon batch of American-style IPA with only mosaic hops, how much should I use? Uh, if it's going to be an American-style, anywhere between five and eight. Uh, kind of depend on, depending on how you want to do it. Uh, five, I would say, would be the minimum. You'd be splitting some between a small bittering addition, some later additions, and then a dry hop. Um, that said, if you wanted to add a whirlpool and get some extra fruitiness to it, they're going to make it a full eight. Um, 
Gern is asking if you could grow your own hop, fresh hops in the USA. What varieties would we choose for overall <laughs> and specialty use? Um, probably just stick with like Cascade and Centennial, um, at least in our climate. That's just because they, they do well here. Um, but I mean, it's, it's yeah, I don't, I don't really want to go back much, much farther into that just because uh, fresh hops are a real pain in the butt to use. Um, but they're, they're an awesome plant, though. They, they definitely look pretty. So I would say grow more for that than for brewing beer. What is our experience with YCH Advanced Hop products like RHO or Tetra? Any ideas where to buy them? A lot of those uh, YCH Advanced Hop products, they don't sell in homebrew sizes. Um, that's, that was our experience when we used like Incognito um, or pretty much any mm -hmm. of those larger hop oil bases. Yeah. So... I don't have a lot of experience with those. Yeah. With but, that uh, said, um, throw a comment down below if, if uh, you know, anyone is interested in those products because we might actually be able to break them down. And I feel like that would be a relatively shippable thing to ship a little vial, um, you know, get a little syringe filled and, and actually ship those out. I feel like we could probably do that for a somewhat reasonable price, you know, probably somewhere in that, you know, 10 to $20 range. So, uh, Rakao and Waidi in a test with the Philly sour yeast or Azaka cashmere. I'd go Azaka cashmere. Um, Rakao and Waidi can get grassy is the only reason because they're uh, yeah. SAS derivatives. Um, yeah, definitely want to take it easy on those guys. Uh, Reverend KY asking us what climate we live in. Uh, technically, high desert, I believe, is our climate. Um, that's that's is that the technical term for it? Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to read, so I didn't hear. We, what you we have said. hot, wonderful summers, and then snowy cold winters i'm um, going out of my comfort zone and brewing with nelson Savin for the first time yay peer pressure i'm scared to death about the cat pee thing is that really a thing with nelson i've seen it a lot less with nelson than i have with uh, other hops yeah um like mosaic and citra, citra specifically. actually yeah it was what, what was that the the 18 crop of citra i think or maybe it was 19 crop of citra it was kind of cat pee like no i'd be 17 18 19 is the one that was out last year yeah Dry malt extract boil at a one to ten. I don't understand that question. If you can go fresh, I think you already did that right. one. Alec is asking if a mash out is really necessary, and uh, yeah, that's a resounding no. Um, totally not necessary. You might get increased efficiency off of it, but, but we've explained yeah. before. People think it's necessary for killing off enzymes, which it doesn't make that doesn't make sense. Yeah, because you're about to boil your beer anyway. Um, but uh, the only reason that it is uh, sometimes useful is for higher flowability, especially with higher gravity yep. wort. Um, it turns your wort into a thinner wort that's easier to flow through your grain bed, so you might get a couple point uh, spike, but if you can't do a mash out, it's no big deal. Yep. So, Flavor wise, uh, it's not going to change anything. Yeah, unless you're having a stuck mash, um, I don't. I don't really see any any need to worry about it. Uh, Minimum time for a yeast starter using dry packets. My kind of catch all is uh, I do 36 hour yeast starters just as a general rule. Um, that said, it's going to it's going to vary depending on uh, uh, on what you do. You can probably get a yeast started a lot quicker than that. Um, but uh, I wouldn't go too much longer than that, honestly. Yeah. So speaking of yeast starters, to answer Tito's question, which she's wondering the best way to wake up a quike strain from um, after washing it uh, um, is slap is, it and throw it into another beer. Slap it. Yeah. No, do a, do a starter with it. Um, take it, take it out, make a small starter. You probably don't even have to do like a full starter, you know, a little half liter starter or something just to kind of wake it back up and, and get it ripping again. So, um, I've had a lot of caffeine getting shaky. They're just saying likes, likes, likes now. Um, likes, likes, likes. Um, C Taz, uh, I am glad that we are your destiny. <laughs> it is your destiny. <laughs> I am your father. Uh, Peter Poem, perpetually recovering from last night. Walked in, glass door, I brew, I fight, my tank top fit right. Someone wrote a poem for me. Doug, yeah, got to go freestyle. All that. Lots of stuff about poems. And do we have any experience with Bobek hops? No. Uh, I do want to buy those, though. I, we have, obviously, they're at Yakima Valley. Yeah. So we've got access, but I have not used them, unfortunately. Um, so Corey is asking. He has a really, I, I mean, that, this could be a whole topic um, discussion, to be honest. But uh, he's wondering why, um, you know, since there's, there's, Variances from hop crop years, right? 
Yeah. Why don't we embrace it like the wine industry does and actually have different vintages? Um, and I think that actually has to do more with just the turnover and the fact that we're using a whole lot of hop varieties at any given time in beer. Um, and uh, yeah, and so wine is also a lot of times going to sit there for a year or two. So Oh, yeah. you are my density. That's what he was trying to say. Oh, density. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Back to the future reference. Oh, gotcha. Are tank tops available? Uh, tank tops are always available. Whoops. Uh, I've been interested in New Zealand hops lately as I've never used them. Is there a particular combo you would recommend for a pale ale? For New Zealand hops? Um, um, I mean, any of them, really. They're uh, kind of, yeah, they're all good. Uh, what would be? My brain's not working right now. Um, Rakao and Waiiti. Yeah, I'd probably go Waiiti because it's a little throw fruitier. Those, throw those in a pale ale. Um, keep it really pale, though. Keep it really pale and use it. It's going to be, like, super lemony. Yeah. Um, yeah, work work off the lemoniness. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I would go, almost say, say, like, Waiiti and, like. Oh, somebody said Pacific Jade, too. Motueka. Oh, yeah, Pacific one. Jade, yeah. Um, Jim. Uh, New Zealand side. And, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think the biggest thing with any of those New Zealand hops is just brew a really, really light, um, you know. Ooh, low. Southern Cross and Motueka. Yeah. There we go. Uh, really, really light, just sessionable beer with them. And <laughs> Tank tops, twenty six ninety nine. Used one hundred and twenty nine ninety nine. I don't even want to know there. <laughs> Pacifica Super Orange. What? I, I haven't, haven't even heard of that one, Jimmy. What is what is Super Orange? Uh, All right, is it time to get the spoken word poem out of the way? All right, spoken word poem time. And then we gotta go. And then we have to go. Unfortunately, sad day. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, by the way. This has been an awesome live stream. And thank you for the 160 watching right now. I think peak concurrent was like 163. Uh, thank you for the 103 likes. We appreciate it. As I'm about to show by making up some poetry that okay. we will definitely call poetry. Go for it. Can you get some snaps or something? You're on. Sla slash some more time to think. Grain. Hops. Water. Water goes into my mash tun. Or is it lauder? <laughs> tun. Water flows through my grain bed. Water goes into my kettle. <laughs> I get my hose ready to chill my wort. <laughs> and then my nose smells beer. And that's a, a very good poem. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you all for tuning in today. This has been so much fun, as always, with you. Be sure to, uh, if you want to support us, um, check out our website. We do have some swag up there. We do have some um, <laughs> recipe kits up there um, based off of our YouTube poll. It sounds like we'll be actually putting together a... Uh, American red ale without any crystal malts. You're welcome. Um, and that'll be our next uh, recipe kit, hopefully up within another week or two. And, um, yeah, so definitely check that out if you want to support us. Um, otherwise, we will see you next week. Uh, well, actually, I won't. Maybe I'll see you. Maybe I'll uh, be talking to you <laughs> um, next week uh, at uh, at least Peter will be here. Yeah, that, and that, by the way, for that poem, that EP is available on iTunes. <laughs> it's a $45 um, download. $8.45. Uh, <laughs> Pacific Standard Time every Sunday. Thanks for tuning in. Someone said, I don't know if we can hear it, but that uh, poem gave him the clap. We will see you all next week. Uh, all right. Have a good one, Subscribe. Everyone. Subscribe. Yes, please subscribe. Hit the likes. Uh, you got some more likes from your spoken word poem, by the way. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Did you have any experience with fruit beer, herbal beer? <laughs> Watch last week's live stream for uh, Gruet Beer. It was actually about it, so. Uh.